everybody. Welcome back to our Came With Fire podcast. Uh, tonight we have a very special guest, Mr. Sean, Dr. Sean McFate. Um, Sean, I'll let you talk to uh, everybody about who you are. First, we're going to do our shameless plugs as always. I Came With Fire podcast is sponsored by Red Clover Coffee. Um, if you want some great coffee that is veteran owned and donates to a lot of really great charities, then I recommend heading over there, picking something out and using code came with fire for 10% off. Uh, this podcast is also sponsored by sheep's clothing LLC. Again, uh, if you want some awesome merch, hoodies, t-shirts, hats, some really cool patches, actually, uh, head on over there, use code uh, fire 10 for 10% off your purchase. Uh, we really appreciate when you guys go over there and support our sponsors because it supports us. It helps keep our sponsorships and it helps support them as well. And these are both veteran owned businesses. So, uh, small businesses is very appreciated. So Sean, thank you very much, uh, for dealing with the technical difficulties we were having before. And, um, yeah, if you wouldn't mind just telling everybody a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, my name is Dr. Sean McFate. I'm currently a professor of war at the National Defense University in Washington, D.C., Georgetown University, and Syracuse University. Um, and I, before this, though, I was, um, I was a paratrooper in the U.S. Army's 82nd Airborne Division. I did that for many years, and then I sort of went to the dark side, became a private military contractor, but not in Iraq or Afghanistan, but in Africa and some other places. Um, where, you know, if you want to study or know war, you go to Africa. Um, did that for many years. Uh, I did some private CIA type stuff as well. I realized in the private military world, which is a euphemism, of course, that there are no old people. So I had a change of, I uh, started to question my life choices. And I ended up going to uh, get a PhD, and now I am in the Washington world sort of one foot in the washington world one foot out and uh still other places so it leaves me very confused and some people consider that wisdom i'm not so sure but you know that's me i think it's wisdom <laughs> for sure so um one thing i didn't know about you um after reading your book um was that you wrote novels as well and i kind of learned that through the process yeah. of learning about you and um i saw somebody say that you were the next tom clancy and uh, i remember growing up and i've read a lot of tom clancy novels um and now i really want to read your novels um but i mean what what kind of got you into wanting to write novels as well as um you know some of the other things we'll talk about like with your book a new rules of war yeah, that's a great question. So the, it was James Patterson who said I was a next film Clancy, who was like a huge New York Times bestseller. And I don't know him. So usually blurbs are friends of the author. They're not really legit. But this was legit. He came out of nowhere. I, I emailed him, thank you. He didn't reply, um, which is which is fine. Um, but so the I, I kind of, I got into novel writing sort of bass backwards. I, um, I had done a lot of very interesting things, some eye-opening things when I was in the private military world in Africa, some things which I'm proud of. And I wanted to write a memoir about one of those things and my agent at the time said no 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 sean if you do this you'll be sued to death or worse and he was right so um we're thinking he's like well why don't you turn it into a novel and i said like, well that sounds hard i mean it's super competitive and but i did it and um you know three novels later um you know that my last novel came out in 2020 called high treason and these novels are like action, th you know, they're, they're like, you know, Tom Clancy things like international espionage, but they're really kind of based on real life. Um, I'm not like a Brooklyn guy in a bathrobe sitting or an L.A. guy sort of sitting in there writing a screenplay. Yeah. I'm taking, you know, real world experiences and you know, changing names, changing some circumstances, smoothing over some of the technical, you know, to, to make it into a readable, uh, fun action novel, uh, because that is, you know, fiction can be a really good way of telling truth. And in some ways, my fiction is the other side of the coin of the nonfiction. I'm trying to sort of pull back the, the veil of what modern war is and so in, in many ways, the the novels they fought. The protagonist is a guy called you know Tom Locke, and he's a very conflicted mercenary. And he's like me. Had I stayed in that industry, 
except he's a lot more badass and a lot more soul damaged. And it's sort of exploring what that looks like. Um, it's not like the Tom Clancy good versus evil or, you know, um, but it's a lot of fun. No, that's pretty awesome. That's cool. I mean, that, that's got to be, that's kind of a wild thought to have that you're taking your own experiences. Your editor says, hey, you could get sued for this. And now some of this stuff is in a novel. Like, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. And, you know, we're talking to Marvel Studios now, too. So we'll see if that goes anywhere. No kidding. Wow. What's that like? Yeah. Cool. Although, just, well, it's um, it's a peek behind the curtain of Hollywood, which is as as confusing and opaque as the Pentagon uh, with as much drama and egos. So, you know, people can draw their conclusions. Um, you know, just to be just to be clear for your listeners, you know, um, you know, uh, only like one out of a bazillion, you know, novels or whatever makes it to a, you know, to a, like a Netflix series. Sure. Um, so, but, you know, it's kind of cool to be in that process. It's kind of be, you know, kind of cool to, to be, uh, to, to seeing some of that. Um, and of course, the world of Hollywood, as you know, is well. I'm a backbencher, you know. I'm a sort of there along for the ride. Yeah. Well, that's pretty amazing. If something turned into a novel, or your novel into a book. Um, yeah. A movie. But uh, so honestly, I just wanted to start jumping in right here on something that I read in your book that I found. Um, so this book for everyone listening, we're talking about is New Rules of War. Um, I could not agree more with your premise. Um, this seems to be a theme that uh, is becoming more prevalent that the United States is is preparing for the new war by preparing for the last one. And yeah. 100% that's um, something that you get at very much in a very different way than like a lot of other books like Kill Chain, um, Stealth War. They kind of all, t Kill Chain's for sure um, when it talks about the technology aspects that you talk about. But um, I do have some questions about it, but I'd like to give you the opportunity because I don't want to jump too much into your book. So people want to go read it and we want people to read it, but I'm um, talking like broad strokes about it. Um, so what for you, for you, like what caused you to want to read this? Is it just your, um, or your, to write this? Was it just your involvement in the, the military apparatus or what caused yeah. you to do this? Well, I wrote the book, the new rules of war, um, because I was angry. Uh, because I, like some of your listeners, you know, I've lost friends in Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria. Um, and, you know, if you, if you look at the U.S. military, you know, if we're honest with ourselves, when was the last time the United States won a big war? Yeah. Right? World War II. Yeah. 70 years. Yeah, we have the best military in the world. I mean, even our enemies know that. So what's the problem? And that kind of set off this book. It's, you know, the book you set out to write, the book you end up with are very different. You know? And um, I, when I got into this, and, and you know, I'm, I'm also, so I teach at the National Defense University, which is the premier war college for the Department of Defense. And, and a lot of you know, my students are, you know, colonels and, and generals even from around the world, not just from the U.S. Joint Services. We also have Intel folks and in some ways it's the world coming to me or coming to you and and you know they were telling me what they were seeing you know stuff that you don't hear about in you know, foreign affairs and other sort of junk uh, journals and you know like they, they tell you what's really going on and and um i wanted to get to the bottom like why what's the problem and um i kind of explain what the problem is in the new rules of war Warfare has changed in a way, you know, and what we need to do, I say, these are 10 new principles, rules of war, how you win. And I'll give you a hint, it doesn't look like what DOD is preparing to do right now. Um, so that's the premise. And also, I wrote the book to be read. I use my fiction writing skills to make it go down like ice cream. So it's not like a dry academic treatise or some, you know, whatever. It's not like an, a think tanky piece. It's you can read it in an airport. There's an audible version. You can listen to it while you're running or driving. It's, it's meant to go down easy, but it's it's full of some very big ideas. Definitely. Honestly, it was a very easy read. I was one of these books that, because I have an interest, like you said, I it's frustrating just kind of seeing some of the paths that the United States is going down. Um, you know, uh, even still being active duty, some of the stuff and the ways we prepare and the discussions we've had, and it just it doesn't make any sense anymore. And something that you you you, you a phrase you use is a durable disorder, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. So 
preparing to fight in the folded gap again, talking about spending all this money on, um, you know, older technologies that are kind of outdated. These are all things that, that I see as well, and they don't make a lot of sense um, to me. So, Zach, I mean, you and I have had this discussion before uh, about what the, the paths were going down. Um, you know, what do you think overall? You're asking me, you're asking Sean. You, Zach. Oh, um, it's, it's interesting. I think I like to believe that, like, I have faith in the U.S. government and the U.S. military to understand, like, what threats are coming. And I have faith that they're preparing for them as best as we can mm -hmm. in our current, like, environment, like how we operate government, how our uh, military operates, that type of stuff. Um, of course, we can't. We'll never have like a 100 year plan like China does or anything like that. Uh, we do operate like Aaron Love has said in previous episodes, we operate in four year plans and mm -hmm. those plans get completely uprooted and then restarted. Um, but I do believe that we're trying to still mitigate issues with future enemies. Um, but I was kind of giving this some thought earlier today when I was thinking of how this conversation might go or how to answer and stuff. And a part of me is wondering if maybe the U.S. government or the U.S. military is still investing in, like, older technologies or the way we kind of – old way that we do battles and wars is because maybe they're thinking that, yes, all these new technologies are great, but if an actual peer-to-peer -peer war broke out, how long would those last? Mm -hmm. How long would it be before, like, a cyber warfare knocked out all your ability to use drones? How long would it be before – um, a hacking thing knocked it out to where you can't use like your satellites anymore, or you can't like communicate as effectively as we can today with like this, right? right? So I'm wondering if maybe the U.S. government and the military is understanding. Yes, we need to invest in these new things, but maybe they're not making their whole military wrapped around it because if all of that fails, then we need to revert back to all right, boots on the ground. We're in the trenches. We're gonna communicate with carrier pigeons or or something, I don't know, but we're going to continue moving forward and kind of get the mission done. And I think that's where, uh, or at least that's what I hope the U.S. government is kind of thinking in where future peer-to-peer -peer war could end up. Uh, but I do believe we still need to invest heavily in future technologies because if you do that, then maybe you could make it to where you never got to that point. You might be able to hack or disrupt or cause enough strength to where you never had to get to the point to where we're now back into a world war one world war two-esque battle hmm. yeah i mean i've thought about that before too um maintaining some of that old infrastructure and in the way we do things as a as a fallback um but sean i mean where you're at like maybe uh the people you interact with the people that you teach like the, it, you probably have some way more unique and in-depth insight than Zachariah in our position. Like, is that something that is uh, is true? The United States is trying to hold on to some of that old infrastructure as a uh, plan B, so to speak? Yes. I mean, the U.S. Department of Defense, um, its new budget is like $685 billion for next year, which is – just to give you some perspective for us non-math majors, you know, that's more than Saudi Arabia's GDP, right? That's pretty wild. Uh, you know, and if you, if you want to look at what kind of war, you know, the U.S. military is preparing to fight, look at what, what, in, look at what they're buying. Look at what weapons they're buying, because that shows you where they're placing their bets. And so they're buying things like Ford-class carriers, which cost $13 billion a copy. And that's before you add sailors and aviation. And $13 billion a copy, that, that's like, you know, half of Brazil's military budget, right, on a ship. Um, that, you know, might go to the bottom of the South China Sea in 20 minutes if there's a shooting war in Taiwan because of, you know, it might get swarmed by hypersonic missiles. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're buying F-35s. The F-35 program costs, the whole program costs taxpayers $1.7 trillion dollars trillion you know which is more than russia's gdp on a single seat airplane that doesn't have any combat missions after 20 years of war in iraq or afghanistan and and i can keep on going but you know these are very you know expect these are all weapons created to wage and win conventional wars mm -hmm. like you know world war ii 
And the truth is, there have been precious few conventional wars since 1945. I mean, you can probably count them on two hands. Uh, everything else is unconventional. Um, you know, and in fact, there's nothing more unconventional than a conventional war. Yet we're preparing to fight a conventional war. Now, let's look at, like, Russia or China. So let's look at China. We are, the Department of Defense is doing all these war games about the, you know, the Taiwan Straits. What are we going to do? But in reality, you know, then they think that if we could win a conventional fight in Taiwan, we can win great power competition. But that's not how it's happening. That's not how the future war is going to go down. Because when you have two nuclear great powers like China and the U.S., as soon as you start having a shooting war, it's going to go nuclear really quickly. Right. That's what made the Cuban Missile Crisis a crisis. And during the Cold War, the Soviets and the United States went bent over backwards to make sure that our, tr our troops were not in the same grid square. And so what we did is we fought using unconventional ways, to, you know, proxy warfares, you know, sending stingers to Afghanistan to shoot down Soviet helicopters, like MI-24s. And that's what we're doing now in Ukraine. We're sending Ukraine. We're, we're trying to make Ukraine into the Afghan-Soviet war to, to deplete Russia. And it's working uh, so far. So, but in we have nuclear great powers, they don't fight conventional wars. Yet we're investing all of our resources and training into fighting conventional wars. And this is another example of generals always fighting the last war they won, which for us is World War II. I have a question about that. Go ahead, say. Um, so what I was, so obviously the U.S., right, we're just, we just came out of like our longest war, 20 plus years in Afghanistan. Um, Iraq's mingled in there, the whole, the whole Middle East, right? Um, Horn of Africa, which we're still kind of in that area. Um, but is, is it possible that the U S is maybe not thinking of like actually, cause we're really good when it comes to like conventional war. Like when we first invaded Iraq, we beat Iraq. I think it was like, what, like seven days, like seven yeah. or eight days. Like right. their whole government was toppled. They couldn't get a plane in the sky. Like they were not a, an adversary anymore, but we were still there for 15, 18, 20 right. years later, because right. we decided to, okay, we went in, we destroyed everything, so we'll try to help you out so you don't become like a power vacuum, um, which still kind of happened anyways. But is the U.S., my question for you, is the U.S. maybe thinking of if we do go to war with China, like maybe just contain it and maybe not actually, like we're not going to try to invade China, we're not going to try to like dismantle their government in any single way it's more so just going to be like here's the line i've pushed you back to this line here's a big smoke here's a big no it's like a 30 day 45 day like really really expensive destructive war in the taiwan strait in the south china sea and it's just like a hey don't do that again and then we just back off Is well that potentially like what we're thinking I, I don't think so because you know the nature of war is to escalate you know, war is like a fire in a building, and, you know, if you don't tend to it, it'll, it'll consume the building. So just say there is like a shooting thing, or it's an accident. Worst case scenario, it's accidental warfare. Okay, like you have, you know, an F-35 and a, and a J-35, two hot shot pilots dueling it out. They rub wings, they both go down, and then... The, you know, then the so the escalation ladder. Yeah. And, it, you know, what happens when they when China, you know, sinks two Ford class carriers, 10,000 Americans go down. Is America really going to walk away from that? What happens we, when we do the same to China? Are the Chinese who are ultra nationalists because Beijing controls it's all state controlled media. Um, and if you don't believe me, then watch their latest film, Born to Fly, which is like their Maverick 2 movie. You know, they're not gonna walk away from it. I mean, so like how does it end? So there are people like at Rand Corporation where I used to work, you know, who believe in limited warfare, and that's fine, which is what you're describing, like in limited nuclear warfare. But I find that like best case scenario and when you're planning for war you gotta you know expect the worst and hope for the best and that should not be a planning factor and also this is a you know get me in some trouble but do we have the political leadership that we need on both sides of the aisle do we have like 
strategically minded politicians? I don't think so. I mean, I think people joining Congress now to become Twitter stars, right? And you have people who who are, you know, you know, avoided serving, you know, in the military, but they are very happy to send other people to die for their bad ideas. So it's not like in 50 years ago where everybody was a veteran of World War II or at least had that in their memory and there was some consciousness about that. And, you know, but today we have... I mean, we don't, I don't want to name names, but it's a, it's a it's a problem for both Dems and Republicans. The yeah. the the people in the National Security Council are may not merit the respect that that we give them, and I have con- deep concerns that idiots, hotheads. I mean, the people who started, you know, the Iraq War and the Afghanistan War. I mean, like it doesn't. I don't see that changing a whole lot. I think, you know, Republicans and Democrats, from where I sit. There are different dogs with the same set of fleas. So that's why I, I'm kind of concerned about this idea that we can fight a conventional war in the Straits of Taiwan and then stop it when it's convenient to us and not let it going out of control nuclear. So I, I totally agree with that because, and I'll say this before, for, you know, this is this Thucydides trap idea that we're both on this collision course and, you know, have to find an exit probably won't happen. But this idea right. that you said of limited war um, is a very, you know, gentlemanly style in it. Um, you, you mentioned like the, the uh, piece of Westphalia um, and talking mm-hmm. about how that changed. Um, and for people who don't know, understand, you know, the idea of general warfare or gentlemanly warfare, medieval Europe, you know, uh, Europe a lord i'm a lord we go to battle we decide to stop you can have this land until you know i decide to go after it again or someone in my lineage will you know and that concept goes away with the idea of the nation state right and then you're talking about you know um uh, being nationalist and all of that right so i i i think that that's a the right perspective um and i love that you totally take like a gloves off approach to talking about this specifically the subversion piece because the yep. Chinese have been doing this for a long time. And it gets yep. said, and I've heard it said over and over and over again um, recently, but it's the truth. And the United States needs to kind of get rid of that queasiness it has about fighting in those ways. Um, like, what would, yep. How would you expand on that? Well, the first thing is, um, in, in the book, I, I talk about this date, 1648, and the Peace of Westphalia. And I try to condense some very complex history into a fun thing. And uh, we're not going into detail about that. I will say that in the Middle Ages in Europe, war wasn't always as gentlemanly as you portray, but there was these norms of warfare. And that, you know, perhaps just like today, the senior people who declare wars, they don't actually have to pay the price for the war, uh, you know, in terms of like being annihilated. Um, and we've seen, you know, that's not been the case in like the 20th century. <laughs> we look at Stalin, we look at Hitler, um, Pol Pot, Mao. So, you know, one of the things that I am working on a new book now that right now is tentatively called Sneaky War. And, you know, it's the, what warfare is becoming, like how you win and fight is, um, is war is getting more sneaky. The reason war is getting more sneaky is because we live in an information age. We have the last 30 years, barring nuclear war, the next 30 years will become much more technologically information, you know, all that. Um, And in an information age, information becomes more important than just raw firepower. I mean, we had raw firepower over the Vietnamese, Iraq, and Afghanistan. The Soviets headed over the the Afghans. Raw firepower used to work in the you know in the 1800s. It doesn't work today. If you want to win today in the, in the age of information, what you've got to do and what China and Russia are doing against us is you wage war but disguise it as peace to your enemy. That's what you do. Uh, Russia was you know is and was a disinformation superpower. China is too. Um, They have something called the three warfare strategy as a way to subvert your enemy from within. So their three warfares are this, um, like media control, like, you know, having CCTV and having, you know, getting their media message out there. 
psychological operations like TikTok, you know, and Huawei, and then also what they call lawfare, you know, using rule of law to subvert your enemies. So we have like a rule of law society, United States of America, if we were going to deploy, they would like try to like gum up they would sue every district a military train might have to go through to, 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 to delay it. I mean, they do all sorts of nasty legal things. And so the idea is not that you invade the U.S. by landing craft like D-Day on California beaches. No, what they try to do is they we know that we have like a blue versus red culture war in our country. They try to use subversive ways and disinformation to stir that pot to get Dems and Republicans, blue versus red, whatever you want to call it, so that we tear our own throat out so they don't have to. And their idea for victory by 1 October 2049, and that is the deadline for them, mm-hmm. is that we we are defeated, not like Berlin of 1945 or Japan of 1945. What we are is we deflate because we tear our own throats out. So we are first world country but we're not a first world power. We're kind of like Italy, right? That would be a victory for them. And that they're trying to do that not through, you know, kinetic force. Yes, they're building up their Navy, et cetera, but their their real, their real sort of uh, weapons are things like three warfare strategy, Belt Road Initiative, coercive wolf warrior diplomacy. They're doing a lot of other th- sneaky things. And I argue that we need to get sneaky, too, like we did in the Cold War, and punch back. So that's the the main argument in my next book. And it's kind of considered to be ungentlemanly. But let me leave it here. Is it it somehow better to lose honorably than to win dishonorably? And my question is, let's win dishonorably, if it comes down to that. Well, we used to do it in the Cold War. I mean, let's not forget that we won the Cold War, and not because we had a big conventional battle with the Soviets. We did it through subversive means, like Afghanistan and Singer Stinger missiles, by doing disinformation within their own Soviet empire. I mean, we did all sorts of sneaky things, and not all of them were good, and not all of them came out clean. I'm not making that case, but... We've gotten to a point now where that's beneath us, and our, our enemies are playing this very well against us. And I think we need to get into the shadows, into the, and we need to consider punching back. And we need to have a discussion about what are the limits of that. But that needs to—that's what we need to do. I think a good idea with like way that explains that is like MMA fights. In an MMA fight, there's two people, they're in their cage, they obviously, like, can't hit each other in the nuts, they can't do all these certain things and stuff, but we're not in an MMA fight with our enemies, we're walking down the alleyway and we're getting jumped by some random person, Right. and I'm not gonna, like, square up and make sure I don't hit you in the nuts, no, I'm going straight for the nuts, like, I'm right. leaving there on top, you know what I mean? I think it's kind of weird. Well, here's, here's some examples, so, like... Russia says, you know, I mean, so the way tactically war looks like now, if you're going to win, is you have to have plausible deniability. So this means like you do operations covertly. If they go sideways, you disavow it or you say it wasn't us. Right. Um, So, you know, if Russia says, hey, those little green men are not there or those Wagner Group mercenaries are not there in Mali. Well, who's going to miss them if they disappear by morning? Right. I mean, if we kill them, is Russia going to say, how dare you? No, we're going to trap them. We're going to use a plausible deniability against them. So the idea, it's like it's like strategic jujitsu, like jujitsu is a martial art where you use your enemy's weight against them. If they're playing the sneaky war game, let's play it back. Let's use it against them. Say, you know, if if those guys are not, you know, if they're they're not there, then we can just kill them and you're going to do nothing about it. And we did this in 2018 in eastern Syria when about two, 300 Wagner Group guys went up against uh, American Delta Force, Special Forces, and Marines, and we kicked their you-know-what. And the reason it didn't go to World War III, I mean, we killed more Russians that night than any night during the Cold War. And it, had that been a Russian battalion, it could have gone to World War III. 
But because the plot of the we could use the plot of the liability against the Russians, both Washington and Moscow walked it back. So we need to get more cunning and clever strategically, and that's what I'm arguing. Because that's I'm not saying it's you know morally a war morally is a, it's a different question, but we need to get more cunning, and we have that. It's just not being privileged in Washington. We have some very cunning like, Americans. Yep. I've talked about like how far you can go with that. Um, would would a way to kind of like get back at China? I was just this came to my mind now. So they have like their their islands, which are like their sovereign territory, but they're like in actual international waters, and we fly yeah. over them, all type of stuff. Could we, in a way, because they're they're international waters, they're not actual islands, type of stuff? Could we be like, hey, to the international community, we're gonna do a bombing raid on this area and just <laughs> tell China like, you better be out of there. I'm telling yeah. you ahead of time. It's, it's a new uh, just it's a new bombed. impact zone. No, I think <laughs> yeah. years ago. So, <clears throat> so you know, we do fun ops, right? Like freedom of navigation operations. You know, yeah. I like it when we fly B fifty twos right through their you know no fly zone. That's pretty cool. But you know, that's necessary, but that's not sufficient. And they're building, you know, basically you know, uh, aircraft carrier islands is what they're doing, you know? Um, and I think, yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, that's right. Um, I, I think it's fine to let those stay there because if there's ever a shooting war, it's easy to turn those into craters quickly. I mean, if you ever have drinks with the U S Admiral, they will tell you, you know, I'm not saying this ever happened to me, but I'm hypothetically saying they will tell you, it's just give us the go and we will take care of the South China Sea in one afternoon. Right? They can. I mean, the US, the U.S. Navy, it's not a problem. It's just like you got to get them the, the green light and they'll do it. So that's not the problem. If you want, um, if you want China out of the South China Sea and you want to do it like via a sneaky strategy, this is what you do. What you do is you get them more concerned about their internal domestic security and the regime security, and they will redeploy their expeditionary forces into China to to defend themselves and domestically. So how do we do that? How do we how do we put pressure internally, covertly? Um, the way there's multiple ways to do this. One is you can do security force assistance on all their neighbors, like you know, all the both Russia and China are very old empires, and they like to remind their neighbors about this all the time. But guess what? Their neighbors hate their guts. You know, for centuries, hate their guts. And if you disarm them, you know, they will be the thorn in the side. Of the, I mean, the, the it's possible that America will be fighting with with Vietnamese and Japanese militaries in the future against China, because everybody hates China and they all hate Russia. So if you can do security force assistance, they will they will be that thorn aside. Let's use special forces like Green Berets to create real insurgencies in Western China. You know, maybe too late for the Uyghurs, um, but let's you know create dumpster fires in their backyard. They hate color revolutions. Let's start a few. Um, you know, let's use disinformation. We actually we don't have to use disinformation. Let's use things like Starlink and pirate VPNs that allow people to Google whatever they want and ask the hard questions. Or my favorite is, you know how um, you know how they come after de democracies. We're open societies. It's easy for we're more vulnerable to sneaky warfare, disinformation. But democracies are more resilient. Autocracies are more capable of waging sneaky war, but they're more brittle. So all we've got to do is let's use that against them. Let's do that strategic jujitsu flip on them. So in autocratic regimes, as your listeners know, it's not even a, a steep pyramid of power. It's like a telephone pole of power. We're all, we have an autocrat at the top with his like uh, lieutenants around him. But the autocrat is always worried about how he goes out. Because there's no retiring for an autocrat. You either die of old age like Castro or Mugabe in Zimbabwe, or you go out feet first bullet holes. So can we covertly convince Xi Jinping or Putin that some of his lieutenants are going to stage a palace coup and he takes them out for us? Do you see what I'm saying? 100%. We could do all we could do these things today. These are things we could do today. 
And I'm not saying we should do them today, but why are they off the table? And I'm trying to put them on the table because that's the national security discussion we need, not how many you know, F-35s are needed or how many divisions are needed. It's like, how, 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 how should we fight this? Can we fight this new way? We should fight this new way, but what is what are the limits of that? What are we prepared to do? What are, what are we prepared to risk if we don't do it? So that's like my purpose, to, to put this on the table. So I, I'd like to eventually go back to what you were talking about before, the idea of like brinkmanship in warfare. Um, but what you were talking about now, creating subversion in, in China, they're very good at controlling the information that goes outside of their country. But obviously some does leak out and there's some pretty good offline sources to kind of find some of that information. But it does seem like there's a lot of civil disrest or unrest that's yeah. that's brewing. Um, right. Just out of curiosity, like how much do you think of that is is some sort of subverted act or is this just the Chinese people becoming sick and tired of the CCP? Well, it's all the above. I mean, our our mission, if we're going to fight a sneaky war, is to put a wedge between the people of China and its communist regime. Mm -hmm. And so maybe you remember last November of 2022, like there were all these huge spontaneous riots in in big cities Mm -hmm. against the COVID policy. Recall that China had this absurdly strict COVID policy. It was like country lockdown for years. Yeah, I still do. Um, and um, and then suddenly, within two weeks, there, there was this huge explosion of dissent amongst the Chinese people against Beijing, against the CCP. And the, and the Communist Party backed down and they changed their COVID policy. It's still pretty strict compared to the rest of the world. But they really shifted hardcore and immediately. Do you know what caused that? I mean, not to put you on the spot, but what what caused that was the Chinese people were all watching the World Cup, the FIFA World Cup. That's right. Which was going on in Dubai. And and they saw these stadiums packed with 70,000 people, shoulder to shoulder, no masks, shouting for hours. Nobody got sick. And suddenly the Chinese population was WTF over. Right. And they 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 rioted. So why can't we help that process along is my point. So that's my point. Yeah. And you said before that, you know, we could and we should start. Like, what do you think is holding us back? Because I've we've had this discussion before offline. Zach and I, other people is like it seems the United States has all these capabilities that we're almost tying our own hands together and not using. Yeah, so there's a couple of things holding us back, but the two, two or three big ones are these. One is that um, the senior leadership of our military is a case study on generals wanting to fight the last successful war, which is World War II. They're looking at the Straits of Taiwan as the Battle of Midway with Ford class carriers and F-35s. Not every general thinks this, but enough where this is the predominant paradigm of the Department of Defense is that if we can just win a conventional war against, you know, China, Russia, we can win it all. Forgetting, of course, of course, are forgetting that that's not how the Cold War was won. And China can maybe do the same thing that we did to the Russians in the Cold War, which is win without a big battle. Um, so one thing is our, our military strategic leaders, by and large, um, you know, we're fighting a 1940s fight. The second big reason is that our political classes have no strategic IQ, right? I mean, members of Congress, member, you know, policymakers of both parties are just out to lunch. And we can get into why that is, but they are just not critical strategic thinkers. And if you look at the sneaky stuff politicians do to each other, you'd think that we'd be the masters of sneaky war, right? If you look at all the dirty tricks they, you know? They're doing it right so, now to each other. That's right. So like if we can just convert that thinking into global politics, I mean, maybe we'd be, you know. Um, the third is the military industrial complex. I mean, Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, General Dynamics, they, you know, they, um, the reason why the F-35 is so bloody expensive is because Lockheed makes sure like a component of that airplane is made in almost every congressional district in the country. They buy off 
Congress, they buy off think tanks, they buy off, you know, and then suddenly you have like the Navy who doesn't want more F 35s, they want more super F 18 things, and they're being ordered by Congress to buy them because it feeds the military industrial complex, which let's not forget, like retired generals go into the military industrial complex, um, congressmen get paid by them. It's just, uh, it, and you know, it's just, a, it's a nightmare. And I don't know how to, I don't know how to unwind the military industrial complex. And just to be clear, I'm only talking about the oligarchy in the beltway. I mean, most, a lot of smaller firms who provide services and products to the Department of Defense, they're not the problem. It's like the biggies. They're the problem. Uh, and every single Secretary of Defense basically uh, serves on the board of one of those. And it's just, it's just, a, it's corruption. So, um, you know, when I used to work in Africa, uh, the worst parts of Africa, they would always tell me, like, look, corruption's everywhere. It's also in your country. Your country's just more polished at it, but it's corruption nonetheless. So I think those three reasons are strategic leadership in the Pentagon, our, our political classes, and the military-industrial complex um, are significant barriers to new ways of thinking about this. Gresham uh, and I have had long conversations about the F-35. I just want to real quick kind of talk about it because it's, it's interesting. Uh, the F-35 is supposed to be like the battle manager aircraft of the yeah. sky. Uh, it has F in its name, but it's not really a good fighter. Like the F-15 is better at fighting. The F-22 is way better at fighting. Yeah. It's supposed to also be like the A-10 replacement, but... I can't think of any TAC P person or JTAC that wants an F thirty five to come do close air support. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah. you have the A ten. Um, it's supposed to be like a baby AWAC or a mm -hmm. baby RC one thirty five, but yeah. the AWAC will do way better than that one because it has a whole right. team on it than the one pilot and the AI in it. The F thirty five is just so interesting because it doesn't do bonding orders. better either. Yeah. Yeah. We order so many of them, yeah. and they're supposed to just replace all these things. Yeah, it's it, it's like the it's like the the, the age old like you have a bunch of chiefs and not enough Indians. So when yeah. you go to fight, you're going to have all these battle managers in the air telling yeah. each other what to do. No, and the truth is, is <laughs> the truth is the F thirty five was designed to be a jack of all trades. But it's um, the old joke is is that you know. Um, you know, basically, the camel is a horse designed by a committee, right? You know, we put a committee to it. And that's the F-35 is supposed to be better at all these things, but it's not better than any of the existing things that we already have. I mean, it doesn't carry as much bombs or as far as a B-52. It doesn't do close air support as better than an A-10. It doesn't, you know, do a, an AWACS. It's supposed to be stealthy, but in multiple, like, air-to-air -air mock battles, it gets blown out of the sky by F, you know, 1980s vintages, F-16s and 15s. I mean, you know, it's and, and every year it gets more expensive, and, and we're making all of our allies buy them. And it's just Lockheed working Congress, in my opinion. Um, and then suddenly uh, you have, when all of our budgets go into these exquisite weapon systems, the first time one goes down, gets shot down, it will be a strategic crisis. Because tactically, we can lose it. We, tactically, we can lose an F-35. But it's now a symbol of American military might. So whoever shoots it down gets a bonus prize. Yeah. And that becomes something the president's going to have to answer to. So... We've made these exquisite weapon systems that are frankly like a Ferrari where we can't ever afford to let them go out of the garage. And um, maybe for a Sunday drive. Um, and plus for all your listeners, you know, guess how much it costs per hour to fly an F-35? Like $45,000? It's about, it goes from like thirty-seven dollars to $45,000 an hour to fly. You know, a per, you know, that's like half the salary of the guy fixing the thing, right? I mean... And they're not all web. No, 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 you know. So there's anyway. It's just it's it's a type of insanity. You know, it's really a type of insanity. So what would you say? It's like the Air Force twenty two. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, so the Air Force and the Navy are both working on you know the next generation air dominance fighter, but the thirty five is kind of at the heart of that, especially when you look at like the the mighty wingman program with all these drones. They're supposed to go with it. Like, do you feel like that is? 100% unnecessary, or maybe not 100% yeah. unnecessary, but... Yeah, when was the last time we had a strategic dogfight? Was it 
Vietnam. Korean War. Korean War. Maybe Vietnam. Yeah. When was the last time there was a strategic dogfight in the world? I couldn't tell you. Maybe the Falkland Islands. Mm -hmm. I mean, why? Why do we think that? Why do? Why do? Like, it's like battleships in 1940. They, it was a dominant, like, king of the sea for, for centuries, and they thought that going into 1940 until the Battle of the Coral Sea in Midway. Mm -hmm. And in the Battle of Midway, the most decisive naval engagement of last century, it was, you know, never did the two fleets see each other, at least the surface fleets. They never saw each other. And after, after World War II, even the traditionalists who were, you know, head in the sand, they were, like, realized, okay, the future is the flat top. And after World War II, everybody stopped buying battleships and started buying flat tops. So the F-45 is like the battleship of our modern era. It's like the Maginot Line today, a very expensive piece of military weaponry that was totally useless in World War II. And so, you know, but they've got their, you know, they've got their claws in the Congress. <laughs> so... So and and also with all these retired generals who come out not all of them but there's a good number of four-star Air Force generals and Marines and other who retire and they get sucked into uh, Lockheed where they're paid outrageous salaries to generally promote um, this in a in a way that I find it some of it to be unscrupulous. Uh, they're kind of like lobbyists. Um, so I have a big problem with this. And you know if you look at the expense of the of the F-35 program, we're talking trillions. Um, you know what, what's the opportunity cost? What if, what are we not what are we not buying that we need to, mm -hmm. right? Wait, and wait. how do you defend? I mean, right now disinformation is one of the greatest threats to our democracy. How do we defend against that? Yeah. Nobody's even nobody's even thinking. I mean, spending money on it, thinking about it. And I bet you, if Lockheed Martin could produce a big, you know, anti disinformation machine for one trillion dollars, then we'd have a solution. But um, we have, like? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> HAL 9000. But, um, you know, I think, I think we, need to, uh, we need to think about how do we defeat things like sneaky war, through warfare strategy, disinformation that really try to corrupt our democracy. It tries to put a cancer inside of our democracy. And uh, how do we fight that? And that's what they're going for because that's the sweet spot. Well, I think that you hit the nail on the head because the United States can't fight a conventional war when we're having an existential crisis at home, which is exactly what it is. And and then you have, I mean, let's put it this way, right? The the DF-17, DF-21, these hypersonic anti-aircraft missiles, they are 100% designed to disarm you know, one of the biggest ways we project power in the Pacific. And if we literally are changing everything, the way we do, the way we're focusing on fighting in the Pacific, that should tell you right then and there that we're not prepared. If one thing completely changes our strategy. Well, also, what happens if they take out all our GPS satellites? That too. Right? I mean, I mean, it's, it's, there's, you know, there's also supply chain issues, right? I mean, like, We've never had to think really clearly about global. How do you secure a global supply chain that feeds this industry? Um, so there's lots of, uh, you know, also back in play are trade wars. We've never had to think about that because during the Cold War there were no trade wars because there was only there's an, there's a communist economic block and a free trade block and that was it. We've never, you know, and right now China and, and the United States are have like mutually assured financial destruction. Is, Treasury is not thinking about this beyond sanctions, which is a small fraction of it. DOD is not really thinking about this. So I think there's many ways to win modern war. Not all of them involve kinetic force. In fact, kinetic force might be the least useful. And we need to get better at the other things. And we can do that today. We just got to decide to do it. So what would you say to those who say that sanctions, like strong sanctions on China, are some of the first steps we should take? Do you agree with that or do you disagree with that? Well, we're going to have to spend like $1,700 for sneakers, you know. Um, you know, I think it's, yeah, um, I mean, there, it's everything. Think about everything that's made in China. Think about if that goes away, how it's going to distort the economy, jobs, well-being, you know, welfare, you know. Who's going to be on the street? Who's not? I mean, look at the solar panel industry in 2017. They got decimated, right? So 
um, and soy farmers, right, in the United States. And, you know, two can play a trade, and it's going to hurt both. But And, like, all types of warfare, uh, the, you know, unintended consequences is the, is the only law that really matters. So, um, you know, and we had Janet Yellen, the Secretary of Treasury the other day, just saying to Congress, like, well, look, we can't survive uh, these embargoes. So the other thing is, too, is that sanctions, if you look at them in Russia, remember like a year ago, like where these crippling sanctions, Russia doesn't look crippled to me. No. North Korea doesn't look crippled. I mean, the what's his name? It's an obese guy. It's uh, Kim Jong-un or whatever. The, the, yeah. I mean, like, when I was in Africa, there's a saying that when the elephants fight, the grass gets trampled. Hmm. And with that, and that's true when, you know, the, the grass is the people. When you do sanctions, whether it's Saddam Hussein or, or Vladimir Putin, the, it, it only hits the, the weak average Joe. The elites always are fine. You know, I do think I do like taking their yachts away that, you know, makes them cry a little bit. I'm happy with that. But have you seen like Russia has not been crippled and there's all these, um, you know, sanction busters around the world. I mean, there, there's a reason why China negotiated a, an oil deal with Iran and Saudi Arabia like a couple months ago is that all of them need their trade. And so I think that sanctions are useful if they're part of a larger comprehensive national strategy but they're not they're not like soft or drones like a one shot one kill thing doesn't seem to work with sanctions um we don't we're not really doing that well, i think sanctions are important but then they by themselves are not going to do much so this idea of like the unipolar world the united states sitting at the top is is kind of quickly eroding right and the, the yeah. um the chinese russia india these you know the idea of the BRICS nations yeah. you just had macron yeah. saying he wants to, uh, the french prime minister wants to go and be at the next BRICS meeting and um how yeah. does the united states kind of cuz i i kind of feel like the the multipolar world is here to stay in a lot of ways um yeah. how does the united states kind of counteract what BRICS is trying to do cuz it's not that strong bricks it's it is a lot of it is a big information campaign right now um but yeah how, how do you see the united states going after bricks and subverting those efforts and maintaining stability i mean that's a tough question but well it's, it's so right now um you know brazil just made a big trade deal with china you've got france working and turkey working with russia um, you know, which is which is its own separate channel. How to deal with Russia? You have India who wants to be non-aligned, like they were in the Cold War, and they have followers, right? And what we've been trying to do is try to create alliances where Russia, I'm sorry, where like China and India are not natural allies, and we're trying to prop up India. Um, but I think in general we've got to change our tune. I think um, America is rightly or wrongly has been perceived as being extremely arrogant you know iraq afghanistan were uh, follies in my opinion not a, nothing against the brave military troops who who carried out their orders there i'm talking about the again the strategic iq of washington is exceedingly low right, right? um so i think what we need to we, we keep on talking about a rules-based order but people are, are everywhere asking what like, your rules whose rules and I think what we need to do is we need to do two things. We need to show that we're more attractive than a Chinese hegemony or, you know, Russia's. We've done a pretty good job of making them look bad, but it's they're not done by any measure. They've done a good job um, themselves, too. They've done it, and we've helped them with that, right? And um, and the second, I think we ought, to, we ought to sneak, we ought to consider doing what I call sneaky war, which is, we got to show that we are tough and that we can win and we can get, you know, that we can't just be Boy Scouts and Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts will win the day at the end because we're honorable. Mm -hmm. I think we did this during the Cold War. We have we've had, you know, national amnesia about this. And again, it's always been clean, but that's the nature of warfare today. And we've got to rack up a few wins to be credible because we're not looking credible post Afghanistan and post Iraq. So, so where, yeah. where do you see some of these wins coming from? Well, I think I think Russia has been a good example. Where we've we've helped. I mean, look, there's problems with Russia and Ukraine and the United States. Like, there's a lot we can talk about there. But by and large, we have uh, armed the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians have shown will to fight. 
to rattle the regime structure of Putin. And that's been, you know, we're, we're trying to make this again into the Soviet-Afghan war mm-hmm. for Russia. We're going to bleed them dry with this this military expansion, you know, this military, you know, idiocy. Um, but right now, we're trying to do things in Africa and South America, but we've long neglected Africa and South America. And now they're like, who cares? Who are you? We've got China. They're giving us money and they're more reliable. Um, so I think, you know, we just take our eyes off the ball. But I think we can... Uh, if we can do a couple things to show that China is not so mighty, that Russia is not so mighty, I think we'll get more friends because remember, those two countries have long been evil empires to their neighbors. Yeah. Vietnam and Japan hate China, Definitely. right? Philippines, they, they went to China and they came back. I mean, so we've just, if we can show that, and, and it takes more than fawn ops in the South China Sea. I think we've got to do things that shake up Beijing the way we've shooken up uh, Moscow and that doesn't mean we go to war someplace in like Cambodia I'm not suggesting that but we, we can do a lot of sneaky things that sh- that make them a little bit more brittle Russia like China's economy is a, has a big problems China has demographic problems it has gender issue problems in terms of there's too many men and not enough women I mean can we not do our own messaging that makes people start to question the promises of the Communist Party so that they start to demand change? And once they start demanding change, we can be right there to help them as if queued up. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of things we can do, but we need to get over this like World War II. It's either war or it's peace and let's, you know declare war and go to war. That's not how it's going to be happening. I definitely agree. The United States has a lot of ground to make up when it comes to a lot of this like saving face around the world, if you want to call it that, and then convincing other people that the Chinese and the Russians are bad. Because um, Zach and I actually met when we were in Africa together, deployed. Um, and uh, you got to interact with a lot of the Kenyans when we were there. And obviously, the Chinese have a lot of influence there. And just getting some of the candid opinions from these Kenyans that I would talk to, they have a very positive idea about the Chinese being there because they build these mm-hmm. ports, they bring in infrastructure, they bring in money and yeah. get jobs. And um, even I had one of them tell me one day, he said, we would rather go over here and work today over with the Chinese than come here. And, you know, I asked him why and it didn't really get a very good answer. Right. But um, w- where you know the making up ground piece that I was talking about? Um, where do you think the United States is doing a good job, and where do you think we need to be better at with with changing minds, right? Not to get too coin right counterinsurgency, changing hearts and yeah. minds, right? But where do you think we could be better at, and where do you think we are doing a good job? I think we're doing a good job with uh, Ukraine. I mean, not wholesale. We can we can discuss the fine print, but I think in general, we've done a fine job of. Um, exposing Russia for being the paper bear that it is and causing mayhem. And we've, we've done a pretty good job. And I have concerns as to how this ends without it going to nuclear war. Um, there's a lot of concerns still. Um, I think we've done a better a help, a good job of making NATO more than just a rust bucket of pro-democracy people. We'll see how long that lasts, but it's lasted so far. Um, where we can do better, I think that uh, and I think we've also done a, a, an improved job of finding allies in like the Pacific, like um, the Australian, UK, American, you know, and, you know, and Japanese quad, yeah. uh, because, you know, we're making taking advantage of the fact that China has no natural enemies uh, and no natural allies. Um, where we could be doing better. I think uh, we need to start thinking a little bit more sneaky, realizing that the status quo is not sufficient to win. That we need to do some things we used to do in the Cold War. We need cunning and clever. But Americans are very cunning and very clever. So we need to find the voices up into the the echelons of power in Washington, D.C. to help influence this. And I believe that um, – I kind of believe in the Ratatouille rule. Like, you know, the, the, the Walt Disney Pixar movie Ratatouille oh, yeah. with the rat? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So in the, in, the, in the movie Ratatouille, there's this idea that – 
Not everybody can be a great chef, but a great chef can come from anywhere. And so everywhere I go, I'm like, let's, you know, we have an intellectual insurgency brewing. Because a lot of people say, yeah, that's exactly, I think, the same thing. And not exactly to me, but, you know, we need to be more sneaky and do these other things. And and um, so we need to find voices that reach ears in the current world of Washington, Republicans, Democrats, whomever, that can influence policy, that can open up a third way of how we do these things and ask these questions like, is it somehow better to lose honorably than to win dishonorably? Um, you know, what's the if, if we if, you know, should the laws of armed conflict be, you know, should we be keeping them because they're obsolete? They're meant to to mitigate con conventional wars like World War Two, which don't exist. Should we update them to modern war or should we abandon them as a noble but failed attempt? Nobody wants to have these conversations. People say laws of armed conflict written in stone. We can't change it. We can't do it. And I think another reason is because many of the policymakers sending people to war never serve themselves. Mm -hmm. So we have what we call moral hazard in public policymaking. And that's both sides of the aisle from like Madeleine Albright to Paul Wolfowitz to modern people. Yeah. So I think we have some problems there, too. When you're talking about, like, increasing our relationship with, like, our allies and explaining them to, you know, democracy's great, America's good, da da da, -da. Uh, Should we also be looking inward, right? So, yes. you know, Abe Lincoln said that, you know, America won't fall from the outside, it'll fall from within. Uh, right. That's, a, that's a, not an exact quote, but that's pretty much what he was saying in, in his quote. Um, and... As a recruiter, I deal with a lot of, like, the upcoming generation, 16, 17, 18, 19-year-olds. Um, I'm 30 uh, currently, and um, I go to a lot of school visits, colleges, all sorts of stuff, and there's a lot of them. And I mean, like, a lot of them that are pretty much, like, they may not be, like, pro-China, but they also won't care if, like, we oh, yeah. lose. I've yeah, because sure. they're in, in their... <laughs> In their mindset, yeah. they're like, well, if I can still, you know, work relatively uh, for good pay, if I can still hang out with my buddies, if matter? I can still, yeah, then why does yeah. this matter? Um, well, and you're I've right. Had, I've had, like, my, I've had a sibling, um, he's very liberal and stuff, and he's he's told me, he's like, I don't have to, us and the liberals um, don't have to fight the conservatives in any single way. We can just wait it out. They'll die off, and then eventually the young will just it's change America to how they want. Right. Yeah. And so, how would you, how would you get like the current generations coming up to, I guess, be more patriotic and be like more inclusive and excited or like well, proud to be also I mean, part of this government that should be helping their allies. In the it's, it's a great question. And I think um, look, the last 20 years of military leadership have been failure. And I mean general officers. And not, with the exception of one or two, not a single general officer was relieved of command for failing to meet mission objectives. So the first thing that I would do would be to reinstitute the tradition of relief amongst flag officers which we did a lot in the Civil War and World War II. Yeah. If you don't, you know, it's what Putin's doing in, in Ukraine the last year. Like, you know, why do all these, and you, why do these, all these general officers who go in there saying, it's, we're pro-democracy, we're going to, and for, also, I've never seen democracy work at the end of a gun, right? I mean, that does, so we, a lot of this is on the failed strategic leadership of America since at least the Cold War, the Berlin Wall fell down. It's, you know, it's the Clinton administration, the Bush, Obama, all Trump administration. I mean, like they all, them and their political appointees, the generals, um, there's been no accountability there. And so that as a recruiter now falls on you to try to explain, because how can you blame them? Who wants to be the, the guy or the gal who's going to go fight in Iraq, Afghanistan, you know, uh, Taiwan? for democracy and also nobody wants our democracy right now and and if you and let's not forget that russia and china are deliberately targeting our democracy they're yeah. deliberately ta making it into a dumpster fire and since we only think about f-35s and not just how to defend against disinformation we own that too so the first thing that we need to do is we need to get better strategic 
thinking, better higher strategic IQ? And that's a good question of like, how do you do that in a political system now of purely sycophants, of, of sort of brown nosers? Um, and it's it's a it's a cross aisle thing. Um, and you know, I think then you know, and so so in terms of getting, uh, I, I sympathize with nineteen year olds, I must say, but I also say that. Um, I would say this, when I, The New Rules of War, the book I wrote, is very controversial. Uh, it is, it's being, it's been widely read in the Department of Defense, the Security Establishment. Either people want to hang me or BFI me, one of the two. They're not, it, and what I've noticed is, um, here's how the book has been received, and this might be a, uh, an answer to your question, is that if you joined the military in the 1980s, like most three and four stars today, you think the book is heretical because mm -hmm. it's, you know, they are very conventional war focused. If you joined the military between the Berlin Wall falling down in 2000 and 9-11, which is me, then it's it's up in the air. And if you joined the military after 9-11, you're like, well, new rules of war makes a lot of sense, right? And so um, there's a generational rift. Uh, and over time, I think that we're going to start to see some of this, you know, group think go away. They'll just die off, frankly. Um, that doesn't, th that's not going to help our recruiting crisis at the moment. But I do think that there are changes coming down the pike. And I think also our enemies are very clever to disguise any threats to galvanize us together. But we're starting to see it. If you see, like, bipartisan support for the threat against China... Some of it's over the top, but they're starting to see that. Um, there's some reasons to be optimistic, but I think the last 20 years have been a disgrace by senior leaders, not by rank and file. Makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, so um, we can shift gears a little bit. I'm kind of curious. We talked a lot about like the human element and the subversion element we can do, but um, one of the things that I've been kind of curious about is the – are there any technologies that you're kind of aware of um, that could help out getting out of some of these ruts of using like aircraft carrier, you know, as a main focus for projecting power? Yeah, that's a good question. So there's a lot of people smarter than me talking about drone technology that's much cheaper, much more efficient. AI, there's a lot of jazz hands around AI. I mean, you ask, you know, 10 AI, AI experts what AI is. For cyber war, you get 20 answers. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I am more skeptical. I think AI, to me, is sentience. You know, that's what, and we don't have that. I mean, to some of these people, Siri, the app is AI. So some people, it's not. You know, I just, right. I think there's too much um, invested in a potential future of AI that comes right from, like, the the marketing selling points from the company pushing it. Um, I do. I think that um, bigger questions remain. I believe in people, not platforms. So I think that we should, in our military, in national security, we should power down decision making to lower levels, like the company grade level or the tactical level. Allow leaders more flexibility to be creative and to fail because you don't learn without failing mm -hmm. and right now it's really hard to fail in our military and go for anywhere yeah. um and we need to change our our strategic culture um so that it's more um not more special operations it, look i'm not trying to sprinkle special operations dust but we need to have general purpose forces that are, again, they're, again, like special operations, they, they, they power down decision making to lower levels, allow creativity, allow failure, and they spend more money on, uh, on, on sort of education on, and not like, you know, grad school or, but like, how do you think critically and creatively? Um, and there's many ways to do that. So like, I'm a big fan of um, the book and movie, The Ender's Game. Love you know, that. you know, yeah. So I don't, I'm not saying we should imitate that, but we, we also need to be more creative and like, we have really well-educated troops compared to most countries and leaders. So let's use that. 
let's we we should right now we put technology ahead of troops i think that's bass backwards so i think we need to, to be more like figuring out how and also that goes into how do you fight disinformation right um and so um anyway so those are the things i kind of lean into not uh what new t i mean sure there's wonderful technology out there but i think what we need to invest in is small unit leadership and a change of culture, which is very difficult to do. I mean, I definitely agree with you on the, the culture piece. And I see it um, now, you know, kind of where I'm at, you know, I'm an E6, right? So I'm in between like the, the senior NCO leadership and deal with like company grade, you know, and then obviously the younger airmen, right? Because I'm in the Air Force. And there is a massive rift, like you said, between a lot of these um, senior NCOs that are in, they, they were around you know, almost 20 years ago and, and going through what they went through. And then you have this generation of airmen coming in now that weren't even alive when 9-11 happened. And it doesn't mean something to them the way it means something to you or to me, right? And so like right. what you said, Zach, getting them to believe in the United States is, is a very, very hard thing to do. Um, but the the idea that Pushing leadership down to that younger level, I agree with. And I hear um, very often uh, disagreement and some of these these ideas that like the Air Force has propped up before and now like Space Force about um, – we don't. It doesn't matter if you if you're sitting at a computer and you're just focusing on you know cyber operations. You don't need to pass a PT test, and that this discourages people who, let's be honest, want to eat pizza and drink Mountain Dew all day, and they have these brilliant minds when it comes to computers and you know cyber technology. You know, would you agree that that's okay to like just say, you know what, this these guys they don't have to be so military yeah. PT tests. Well, we need to think think this through. And so the UK military is doing some of this. Okay. Um, the 75th Ranger Regiment is doing some of this. They have a new battalion. It's something called like the Military Intelligence Battalion, but it's it's like hackers and people, and they're having a problem because good luck finding a hacker who wants to do a 20 mile ruck march, right? right. And uh, get a 300 PT, exactly. right? So warfare is changing, and warfare, cha you know, warfare changes before warriors do. And we need to update not just our laws of armed conflict for modern warfare, but we also need to – our warrior ethos also needs to shift. Yeah. And so if you want to – you know, again, in the new rules of war, I explain what modern warfare looks like. Mm -hmm. In my next book, I explain how the U.S. can win it. But right now, if you look at modern warfare, it is not about – you know, Iron Mike, follow me, Fort Benning. I'm an I'm an old infantry army, eleven Bravo grunt. So um, the uh, you know we need to accommodate, we need to evolve. And now maybe that needs to be two different tracks. There's like the high PT track and the low PT track. I mean, like yeah. whatever, and and different sort of awards, rewards, honor, you know. But I don't think it's an. It doesn't have to be an either or. It can be an and equation. But how do we instill that culture is a big job. And I'm not so sure, you know, uh, four star or, you know, command sergeant major of the army, do they get this? Do they not? If they do get it, what can they do to change it? Um, the Marines have done something a little similar to this with General Berger, who's now leaving as a comment of the Marine Corps with something called Force 2030, which has been very controversial. Mm -hmm in the Marine Corps, I think it's really interesting. I like the fact that at least the guy has, you know, the cojones to try to shake things up a bit, you know, whether it's right or wrong, I don't know. But, actually, um, I'm but I think, familiar with that. Um, yeah. would, you, would you be willing to expand on that? Oh, yeah. So in the Marine Corps, General Berger is the, the commandant. He's, he's outgoing and his vice is taking over. And he proposed uh, this bold new plan about how the Marine Corps are going to fight in 2030. He did it like almost on day one of his tenure, and I like it. Now, now his, it's become a, a very acrimonious debate in the Marine Corps, especially amongst retired generals. Like retired General Van Ripper is going out publicly dissing, you know, which is not something Marines normally do, right? Yeah, it's very fine. controversial. But what he's done is he's taken all the tanks out of the Marine Corps. Yes. He's taken all of like the tubed artillery out of the Marine Corps and says, we're just going to use rockets and, and missiles. We're going to put all the attack helicopters in warehouses. We're going to use drones. And we're going to also 
we're going to be smaller, more agile. We're going to shape shape the way we train, we think, we do resupply. I mean, it's really is changing the marine way of warfare, not just the technology piece. He's thinking it through. And of course, for again, generals always want to fight the last war. This doesn't look like Iwo Jima to some four stars who are retired, and this to them is very threatening to the marine identity wow. they think the marines are going to get killed out there in the, in the south china sea and i don't know you know i don't know your readers can can look into it and decide where they come down on it but it's it's very rare to have a four star in in a position of command risk it all risk his career his legacy on making big changes like he's done mm-hmm. now his successor says he's going to keep those changes but you, you never quite know in washington so we'll have to sort of stand by That's i was talking with the uh talking yeah. with the marine recruiters in my area or my area because we all get along yeah and some of them were talking about how there's and it's just a rumor, but like the rumor mill, it goes back to like the early 2000s. I think the commandant at the time was talking to Congress and he was telling them like the U.S. doesn't need a Marine Corps. It wants a Marine Corps. Yeah. So there's like that, there's a whole like saying there, true. like it's not it's not needed at all. The Army, the Air Force and the Navy can do everything the Marines can do. But because of that, like premise, they yeah. don't, they'll just have the Marines still exist. There's a rumor and the idea is that the Marine Corps is actually going to, like, it's supposed to be dissolved. It'll still mm-hmm. exist. You'll still be U.S. Marines, but it's supposed to be fully integrated back into the Navy to where, like, oh. to be a well, Marine. So you saw your face, Sean, when he said that. You were a little like, hmm. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, so the rumor, yeah. okay, so it's not really, a, so here's the, here's what I know, is that, Berger doesn't want the Marine Corps to be just an independent second army. He wants them yeah. to be more integrated into the U.S. Navy. Correct. Um, no, it doesn't mean dissolving the Marine Corps. It okay. means uh, just working, you know, more integrated with the U.S. Navy. And let's be, let's face it. I mean, the 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 Marine Corps' logistical supply is all Navy. I mean, yeah. you know, it, it, they. They're not like the Army or the Air Force where they have to have a huge lot. So they're already in, he, he just wants to remind the Marines that, like, look, we are here to serve next to the Navy, uh, especially in the war for the Pacific. And he also is very Pacific focused. So the idea of sending Marines to Afghanistan, to Iraq or to Vietnam, he would he would do it if ordered. But that's not the vision he has. Yeah. So uh, it's not going to be Marines in name only. They're just going to be much more integrated with the Navy. Yeah, the idea, I think, is more because it comes from like how the Air Force treats the Space Force. Um, <laughs> it's not it's not like a new thing. They literally yeah. just took U.S. Air Force Space Command and just said, hey, you're your own thing now. Um, right. But they are fully still under like there's not going to be finance personnel in the right. Space Force. There's not going to be fo- security forces in the Space Force. Right. There's not going to be uh, there's only six jobs currently in the Space Force, actually. Mm. Uh, Interesting. Side. Um, and so. I think that's what he's trying to get at too is the Marines, you're not gonna have like a finance marine or an admin right. marine or a personnelist marine right. or um yeah. like all those types. You're just gonna have here's your infantrymen, here's your yeah. raiders, here's your yeah. like your special so op dudes. He's and turning here's, here's right. your that, like backup people to kind so of So the Marines the Marines um there's always been a dual vision of Marines. Like are they their own independent, like small army? Are they connected with um, the Navy and they're just the, the land teeth of the Navy? Mm. And that's what he's moved to. Like all the admin, logistical, all the combat service and service support, let the Navy handle that. We're just going to be, we're going to be the fighting force that nobody wants to see hit their beach or hit, you know, drop into the airport. Um, and that's, that's been happening in their recruiting yeah. efforts. Like the recruiters, yeah. I've, in, in the Marine Corps in general, like, they recruit way less admin Marines, finance sure. Marines. It's like if they're getting smaller. And some of them even transfer, like some Marines have transferred to the Navy. Like they're not even mm. in the Marines anymore. They're part of the U.S. Navy. So. Oh, wow. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Well, the, Marine, the new Marine Commandant or the named one says he's going to continue this practice. We'll see. It sounds like he's got his head in the right place. He's trying to adapt. Like what? I mean, let's let's be honest. That's what you're talking about. Is is you yeah. have to be the best at adapting to change. Otherwise, you're going to die. You know. Right. And that's that's true in nature. We're a part of nature. That's true in warfare and the way we conduct ourselves. Right. So, um, 
No, I think that he's got his head in the right place. I hope that this next person coming in can take that and run with it. And like you said, yeah. you know, Washington's a, a weird place, and that whole process could change with a new president, and it could just stop. You know, so that's right. I really, I really but I, it does. I'm, I hope so too. And I just, you know, even I, I like it. I'm, a, I'm, I'm, uh, I favor it. Um, and uh, even if it's not the best idea, the idea that you have somebody with any idea that's new. I encourage, you know, it's like, who's a four, who's been in the, in the service for 40 years. I mean, I just like, yeah, exactly. So, um, anyway, I admire him. Yeah. I admire him. I mean, you know, in Washington, senior ranks, people are more willing to, you know, risk their life and their career. So, uh, you know, it's good to see. Most definitely. Um, the air force has done, is doing at least a lot with like innovation and getting uh, the younger airmen involved. We have um, something called spark cells now, which are just these places on base that have a lot of different technologies where it's encouraged for the people who work there. They're all active duty to wear civilian clothes so that when airmen come in, you may be talking to a, a major, mm-hmm. who's a C-17 pilot or whatever, but you may not know that because he's got a beard and he's wearing khakis and a polo, right? <laughs> it's just kind of encouraging those conversations to flow because if you're that that brand new A1C who sees something that needs to change in whatever, you may not talk to somebody wearing a flight suit. So, um, I mean, I, I would be curious if some of the other branches are, are doing something like that. But it is a grassroots change, kind of like what you were talking about, about getting the leadership from the or the uh, the ideas from the lower level involved in making a way of making a pathway for those ideas to get to upper echelons of leadership yep. because it cuts out a ton of the red tape. Yeah, I think I, I, I encourage new ideas of any sort. And I think, you know, when you want to change culture, mm-hmm. you've got to do it from the top down and bottom up, you know, from the bottom up, things like this. And you'll see this in the special operations community, right or wrong. Um, but you know what? The U.S. The U.S. military has, you know, some of the most educated NCOs and enlisted in the world. I mean, the NCO Corps of the military, our military, is better than the Army, uh, the military, the officer corps of many other nations. Mm-hmm. And so let's lose the Napoleonic model of serfs and aristocrats, right? I mean, it's just... It just makes no sense. So I like the I, I like the idea of trying to be um, of mixing it up. Also from top down. I mean, right now, if you want to become chief of staff of the of the Air Force, and you're a fighter pilot and only a fighter pilot, right? Um, you know the and the Navy has its ver- submariner or aviator. Uh, the Army has its version of that. Um, you know, and so maybe we need to think about maybe instead of having a fighter pilot, we have a transport pilot or uh, an intel person. I mean, because they will then change the culture top down too. Maybe we should we think about you know what are the criteria to get promoted to E7. Do you have to do things that are sort of not traditional? I mean, there's all sorts of ways to incentivize people to change the way they think. And we've done this before. In 1986, Congress passed the Goldwater Nichols Act, which is all about trying to, how do you create more jointness in the military? Like, so that Army and Navy and Air Force, they can all work better together. And they, they did a lot of things, um, including like to become a, a general officer, you had to serve on a joint assignment. Mm-hmm. Now, before Goldwater Nichols, only sort of like the lowest tier would get a joint assignment. All the the, the best ones were given like your your army all the way, no, or your air force all the way. And now to become general, all the the, the most ambitious individuals are now seeking joint assignments. Mm-hmm. So there are many ways to to tweak this, and I think I like this idea of you know being casual. Uh, you know, to the extent that it doesn't ruin operational readiness, but maybe it enhances it too, you know, for certain types of units. So I like the idea of it. I've heard the idea a lot floated that the all the branches, the Air Force, Army, uh, Navy, need to be better at communicating as far as not just across like leadership wise, but equipment, technology, stuff like that, where, you know, if I couldn't even give you a good example, but that there needs to be more like data link type stuff between the branches if you're going to fight you know without having to execute all these different line items you know to get to be successful to get where you're going um you know where where do you see some of those as being linchpins into you know creating those those successful data link points between the branches if any 
It's a great question, and I'm not sure I have a good answer for it. I mean, you know, if, of course, you would live in information age, like I said, warfare is more information bound. That also means tactically and operationally in war, you've got to be better synced, faster, quicker. Uh, people think AI can help with this. I've seen things like Palantir, uh, which can do these some of these things. Um, you know, so, you know, that I think... I think a lot of it comes down to not just the equipment, but joint training, you know, rather than just having a Marine class and a Navy class and an Air Force, maybe they all go to like Fort so-and-so and they all learn together on the same equipment and learn the same language. I mean, I don't speak Marine, even I was in the military for many years. Marine still eludes me. Um, so, um, especially if they do... Yeah, it, you know, the Marines, yeah. Um, but, I mean, maybe it starts... I mean, I'm sure there's technological linchpins and nodes. Of course, you know, if there's linchpins, how do you defend that against, atta you know, information attacks? But I think it starts... You know, I'm a big fan, and it starts in the human domain first. And, um, you know, going to a training place for four weeks, living, eating... You, you start to learn about, and I don't see why that has to be when you're a senior NCO or a, what, you know, or a, a major. I mean, I think yeah. that can start when you're an E5 or even, even, you know, even sooner, you know, I don't know. So I think it starts, uh, the common operating picture starts uh, in training and early. I think, I think you're right. And I also think that the, um, the military in general is going to need a big upheaval in a lot of ways. It's going to take a long time and a lot of different phases. Um, but uh, one of the things that I'd like to kind of just ask you real quick is um, you talked way at the beginning when we started this conversation about how um, back after World War II, you know, these people in politics that had spent time in World War II were very familiar with it. How do you feel about like mandatory military service as a requirement for political office or just in general? You know, I don't, I don't say as much, but I, I kind of favor the idea. Um, so one of my military mentors is, is General Stan McChrystal, um, and he believes in this strongly. And, uh, you know, I think that it's a good idea that that there should be what well, I didn't consider is mandatory service. Now, I think it could be like two years military service or three years civilian service. Mm -hmm. Civil service means like, you know, you're a war, you know, you're working in a hospital or you're an ambulance driver or you're a social worker. I mean, there's many, there's many things and that everybody should do it. Uh, or maybe it's a year and two years. I don't know how long, but everybody should do it because it's like the common, otherwise we all get stovepipe in our different cultures. And, um, and I think it's good to do before college. Um, and I certainly, so I think, but I can see why a lot of people in the military don't want this because they remember the bad old days of Vietnam where they emptied out the jails. It's sort of like the Wagner Group today, emptied out the jails into Vietnam. But remember back then, it was very easy to dodge the draft. It was very easy to get out if you had enough money or connections. So it wasn't exactly fair. And what I'm thinking about, it's fair. Um, I, uh, you know, but I, I, I understand why there's a lot of reasons, you know, politically why nobody would would say that. I do think that. I do like veterans who run for Congress or people who've done something in public, the public sector. Um, but the problem is, if, if you have a um, if you have a mandate that only veterans can run for Congress and decide war or not, then some people might say, well, you're kind of militarizing national security decisions. And, you know, it's a valid concern. So I'm not sure what the answer is. But I do think it's a problem that less than 1% of our country serves in uniform when our uniform wants to go to war all the time. I believe that if it was 2005 in the Iraq war, if we had national service, we would have left Iraq in 2006. Yeah. Because people had no skin in the game. It was very easy to be USA, USA, if you or nobody you knew had to risk their life for it. Yeah. Right? And, and so I'm really, I'm really, um, Hell bent against that. Uh, it's called again. It's called moral hazard and public policy making for nerds out there. But um, I do I do like the idea, but I'm not sure I would legislate it. But I I kind of 
part of me kind of does too. So I don't, I'm, I don't know where I sit on that right now. I'm there with you too, that I think that it's a, that's why I'm more of a fan of not required military service because it's not even like what you mentioned before about, um, you know, back in Vietnam and dodging the draft. It's, we've all served with people who you're like, man, you really shouldn't be here. And when you start forcing people to go into positions in the military, you know, you're, you're kind of engendering that, right? Which is why I'm okay with, like you said, civil service in some, some capacity, I think is a great idea a year or two um you know that that to me makes a lot of sense i also very much agree with your um you positing that it could militarize you know the the government i don't Mm -hmm. think that's a good idea um i don't think required military service or political office is a good idea it's just kind of curious what you your thoughts on it were um but i do think some sort of civil civil service whether i mean you can make it optional you're right you know military service or some something else you go and like you said you're working in a hospital you know maybe even you learn a trade with it you know something that's not just you know it's not saying oh well you're now existentially a better person for having worked in a hospital because we told you to for two years you come out with some sort of your phlebotomist now or something like that on top of whatever it is you want to try and go and do so i think something like that is a good idea um and you know if you made that a, a national policy obviously then everyone would check the box for for political office but yeah no i like your answer i i agree with where your head is at on that one so what about the idea to fix our like our political landscape by finally getting term limits put in. <laughs> well, on that. The, the only people who can decide on term limits are the people who would benefit least from them. So that's the problem. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think that'd be a great idea. I mean, the founding fathers, uh, you know, they had lots of problems, we know, but they imagined Congress more like jury duty. Like mm-hmm. people would go for one or two of years or two or a few terms and they, they'd leave to go back to private life. They didn't, imagine career politicians who are mostly attorneys um you know so yeah. whether that's right or wrong i don't know but uh i like the idea of term limits um i just don't think it's it's realistic um yeah, i mean it's like the electoral college i don't like the electoral college at all but to get the electoral college you need a constitutional amendment to do so i think and that would require all the the least populated states to agree with that and this it, it clearly benefits them you know so i don't think you know, getting rid of electoral college is going to happen anytime soon yeah so we we talked about obviously like uh unconventional war and being sneaky all this type of stuff um i kind of just want to ask you it's it's a two-parter um are we at war already today we just haven't officially declared it because mm-hmm. it's not conventional. And then how do you foresee um, the future of America when it comes to like wars like coming up? Like in the next 10, 15, 20 years, is South China Sea going to be nuclear? Is uh, Ukraine going to no longer exist? Is like, what's your idea here of kind of what we're about to be pulled into or what you kind of see us? leaning towards yeah well the first question we of course we are already at war with china and russia they know that mm-hmm. and and right now and, and we used to think this way one of my rules and new rules of war is that it, it's not war or peace it's war and peace mm-hmm. right and that's what russia and china think about it's not you know it's not war or peace where we think about war like a like it's pregnancy either are you're not mm-hmm. when in truth the answer is yes. And we used to think this way during the Cold War. I mean, was the Cold War a war or a metaphor? Well, if you ask Cold Warriors, it's like, no, it's not a metaphor. It's a real thing. Mm-hmm. And somehow in the last 30 years, we've lost that nuance at the highest levels of government. So, of course, and what our enemies are doing is that they wage war but disguise it as peace to us because we want to, we're looking for a light switch to flip. Yeah. And so what they do, they look at China, South China Sea, they go, they, they play a game of chicken where they go right up to where we flip that, flip, that, flip that light switch to on and they stop. But they keep everything they capture, they create. And they've been doing this for 10 plus years. And that's how they're winning the South China Sea, not with better aircraft carriers, but they're, they're doing strategic jujitsu against us. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we are already at war. That doesn't mean we have to launch MOOCs. We just need to be more nuanced, strategic thinkers. That's all I'm saying. And we have been in the past, and we should be today. Um, so what does the world look like 15, 20 years from now? Uh, you know, I, 
I don't know. I think that, you know, Ukraine will stalemate. I think what's going to happen is, um, who knows what's going to happen. I mean, but either way, let's, let's leave that aside. Here's something that I think is going to happen that nobody's paying enough attention to, mm-hmm. is that in 20 years or 30 years, multinational corporations and super rich people will become superpowers in their own right. The reason is, is because mercenaries are not just the Wagner group. They're around the world. A lot of my earlier work is on mercenaries. It's, I'm one of the, I consult to the, the, the Department of Defense, to Hollywood, to, to video game industry, uh, to think tanks about the mercenary world. And, and it's getting to a point where like ExxonMobil can have its own private military where Elon Musk can have its own private special operations or space force. And that will change who has power and how they use it around the world. So everybody's here considering about America and China and Russia. I'm like, who cares? I mean, yeah, U.S. and China, the top 10 GDP earners. But the World Bank recently did a, a report of all the top revenue earners in the world only of the top 100, only about one quarter were nation states. The other wow. 75 fifths, 75 percent, were multinational corporations. And let me tell you, having worked for a few, they're not loyal to America. I mean, look, how many of them have tax havens offshore? Good luck finding a patriotic CEO. They're loyal to the quarterly in, in statement. Is what they're loyal to. And so what happens when you have super rich individuals or corporations who have their own sort of international security interests? Now they can hire their own mercenaries, their own private armies, their own. And, and I'll tell you, you can rent MI-24 find attack helicopters on the private force. You can get ex-Green Berets and ex-SEALs. You can get anything except for nuclear weapons. And that's going to change global politics in ways that we haven't seen since the Middle Ages where states are still around, but many states are more like counties in the United States. Like they're, they, they can, like they're in charge of building bridges and giving out speeding tickets, but they don't really have that much control of who goes through their county and what they can do. And so a lot of states in the world, like, you know, Gabon in Africa or Venezuela, or I mean, it's just most states in the world are not, we always think of the top, you know, the top 10 strong states, not the bottom 180 weak states. And if you look at the Fortune 500, all these super powerful billionaires who grow more brazen every year, there might be wars without states. Not, it's not going to happen in the United States, but it, it'll happen to regions that we care about, and it's gonna, it can even suck us into wars. I mean, what happens if a human? Look, what happens if there's an ISIS 2.0 in Syria, and they start, you know, crucifying Christian men and selling Christian women and girls into sex slave markets with apps, like they used to do in 2014, 15. Mm-hmm. What happens if a mega church, United States, which has like a ninety million dollar, you know, budget, hires mercenaries to stage a humanitarian intervention to save those, knowing that the U.S. and the U.N. won't do anything, yeah. right? That's the world. That's the mid-century, but nobody wants to look at it because it's too science fiction. That's the world. I, that's why I use um, novels to talk about some of these yeah. things. You but said that's the, fiction. There is I mean, a... well, it's fiction, but I mean, like. It's the future, and I think we can't ignore this possibility. And the fact, yeah, China and the U.S. will still be there. Uh, some strong states will still have clout, but in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, South Asia, a lot of parts of the Middle East, and a lot of parts of the world, I'm not so sure states are going to be calling all the shots. I mean, you can even argue today that big oil companies, they show up into the Gulf of Guinea in Africa, they get very political. And they hire private CIA types and private military to do stuff that looks very much like a, what a state would have done 50 years ago. Man, what you're talking about is yeah. thinking like uh, I'm got two thoughts going in my head. Right, I was thinking like the way the Romans did did the military, and you had these these um, bureaucrat generals and politicians that commanded their own armies. They weren't allowed to cross them into the Rubicon, you know, all this stuff, and they they went and did what they wanted to do for clout, and then. Now you're talking too about this whole idea of having these, you know, large conglomerate businesses, mega churches, you know, Starlink, Elon Musk, right? And they have um, their own private mercenary groups. It's almost like a, a neo feudalism in a way because you have, That's right. yeah, you have these these 
oligarchs essentially with all this money and then you've got all these people that work for them and then they call them up and they say okay now go that way which is totally yep. feudalism when you think about it at its root so in my first book uh called the modern mercenary which came out 10 years ago i i predict the wagner group and at the time people were like oh you're like no one the arc forget it um <laughs> i also uh i i talk about this world called neo-medievalism mm. where anybody like this idea that we grew up in sixth grade, that only states can wage war, that that was not what most of history was. Mm -hmm. Mercenaries are the second oldest profession for a reason. And they're hard to get rid of. Yeah, uh, they're hard to get rid of. Uh, now they're coming back. And if you look at the last 250 years where it's nation states not, with their own national armies, and they outlaw, literally they outlaw mercenaries. That's where the stigma of mercenaries comes from. That world is unraveling back to actually normal, which is force is a commodity on the marketplace. It's always been considered an honorable but bloody trade. And even in the Middle Ages, popes hired mercenary armies like Pope Innocent III, uh, you, know, uh, f you know, families, rich families hired mercenary armies, the Obamas versus the Trump, but they're on mercenaries. Who knows? Um, uh, you know, city-states like Florence would hire them. I mean, like, mercenaries were considered, I mean, noble, the, 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 the second, third sons and noble families would go off, like, the first son would take over the lands, the second son would go to the church, the third son would take over his own mercenary army, and then would fight in, 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 and so, you know, that's the world we're coming back to. Like, in 2019 or 2020, for example, the CEO of Nissan, the, you know, the Nissan Motors, um, was being held under strict house arrest in Tokyo by the Japanese authorities. Yes. He, he, remember, he paid an ex-Green Green Beret mercenary to pop him out, yeah, which yeah. they did in a CIA expo operation on that. a private jet, and they flew him to Beirut in Lebanon because Lebanon has no extradition treaty with Japan, and the man lives free in Lebanon today. Wow. And, you know, every millionaire in the world, not billionaire, every millionaire in the world, the light bulb went off, says, I had to get it a jail-free card, Right. Um, in 2021, um, you know, the head, the, the president of Haiti was assassinated in his bedroom by Colombian mercenaries. Now, we caught the mercenaries, but they don't know who hired them. They, the mercenaries give you extreme plausible deniability, which is the way of modern war. So that means that somebody got away with killing a head of state in a third world country and got away with it clean. So every time you see a success, it's going to be imitated someplace. And this idea that war is going to come down to a conventional World War II fight with better technology in the streets of Taiwan, just, I think they're as ignorant as the French were building their Maginot line. I, that's, it's, wow. it's crazy talking about this mercenary thing because uh, I'm a big gamer. And in 2014, Call of Duty came out with a game called Advanced Warfare. It yeah. has Kevin Spacey in it or whatever. And the whole premise of the game is it's like the it's 2050s, and governments don't have their own militaries anymore. Like they still yeah. have like a nuclear arsenals and stuff, but they hire private militaries to do stuff for them because then they don't have to follow like law of armed conflict and they don't have right. to do all this other type of stuff. And it, it's an interesting story because like you're you know, you're hired to go fight, like, some Russian mercenary group or whatever yeah. as an American, and you're, like, fighting them, but then, like, halfway through, your organization was given, like, a better deal by the Russians, yeah. so then you have to turn, like, you were in a battle well, with the other yeah. mercenary group, and then you're all of a sudden both on the same so, side. And you're no, you're right. So, this. there's some truth to this. So, I spent, when I was writing my book, The New Rules of War, I spent quite a few months in northern Italy, I know it's hard duty, uh, researching the way mercenary warfare used to happen. Uh -huh. And mercenaries, private warfare, which is going to reemerge, it's very different than the way we're taught about warfare today because suddenly, like, military strategy merges with market strategy, where the, the strategy of eBay now is applicable to war. So buying out enemy mercenaries, uh, you know, all these, there's a lot of other tricks they used to do that were, you know, we don't do now, um, but we need to, because this is all happening. And I was in that world, I won't say which world that is, but those things were happening even when I was in that world. Mm -hmm. 
and all these Wagner Group mercenaries, this war will end someday. They're going to go looking for new jobs, right? And uh, all those mercenaries and private military contractors that we hired in Iraq, Afghanistan, they're in Yemen, they're in Libya, they're all over the place. They don't, they're not like cheap army reservists who just go home and reintegrate into the civilian workforce. No, some of them might do that, but some of them look for new contracts and they're out there. And so this mercenary world is bubbling beneath our feet, but because it doesn't look like war to the CIA, the CIA doesn't track it. Well, yeah. And then we're surprised by the Wagner group. Yeah. Well, it's, May, it's maybe odd the because state. the United States is ripe with 20 year combat veterans, right? Yeah. That are yeah. perfect for that. <clears throat> well, they show up in places like Erbil as well. Let me tell you, they show up in these places. I wish maybe, maybe some of them show up in Ukraine. Maybe oh, the yeah, sneaky, they... uh, maybe the sneaky mm. warfare, and maybe the U.S. just uh, gives Wagner Group maybe a couple million more dollars. Well, I actually suggest this in a Newsweek article, but uh, it was very controversial. I said, "Why are we sending expensive M1 tanks over there when we could just bribe them off the 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 field, the battlefield?" Yeah. You know, and we could do it. It's much cheaper, much safer. It's more humanitarian. I don't consider myself a humanitarian, but I like it when it works out to be more humanitarian. So, uh, thanks for the AK. Here's your M4. Shoot that way. Thanks. Well, I wouldn't do that, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, uh, but um, but you could you could put them into a like a POW camp or refugee. Camp. I mean, there's things that you could do to disarm them, and and a lot of those Wagner guys don't want to be there either. Let me. I talk yeah. to them sometimes. They do not want to be there. They're not happy. Yeah, I just saw a video yesterday of uh, some of them shooting other Russian troops. You know, yeah, because they're retreating. Yeah, yeah, it is. uh, What we should be doing is sneaky war. We should be doing our best not to give F-16s, but to turn the Wagner Group against the Russian military and to turn Putin against Prigozhin, so Prigozhin gets killed by Putin, and then Putin puts the kill order out in any Wagner Group guy. That's what we should be doing. But no, we're just giving them tanks and ammunition and F-16s. We're idiots, in my opinion. Yeah. We don't, we're not clever and devious enough. This is but I know that you have, I know you have devious listeners out there. Oh, for sure. This is all very like Bond level stuff, which makes is, is, to, is totally interesting and I like it. But um, one it's, question I like – go ahead, Zach, real quick. I was going to say – Crazy says bond level stuff. I was watching a YouTube video today because I wanted to say it earlier, but there wasn't it, it, and it fit in uh, with us talking. You talked about how like your fiction novels are based off of like real things you did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. James Bond, the person who created James Bond, Ian like, Fleming. Yeah, he yeah. was like he was he worked for a colonel or a general during like World War yeah. II or whatever, doing a whole bunch of like espionage stuff. Mm-hmm. It's like yeah, Colonel Fitzroy or something like yeah, that. Yeah, he wrote. James Bond and a whole bunch of those things based off the ideas they had in right. World War II and stuff. So it, it's yeah, it coincides. Yeah, yeah. Fiction's a great truth teller. I mean, it's not just. There's a lot of novelists who've done this. Um, Tom Clancy's not one, but um, the guy who wrote uh, Ticker Tail, uh, uh, Le Carre, he was in MI6, and he wrote in the 60s about it and uh, th- through fiction, and it was very, very telling. So yeah, there's there's a precedent out there. Well, Sean, one, one question I like to ask everybody is uh, what piece of advice would you today, who you are, after everything you've gone through, lessons you've learned, would you give young Sean enlisting or yeah. going into the army back in the day? Uh, well, gee, there's so much I would give my young I – mean, look, I would say this, is that um, some of the things I really wanted, my ambition – you know, like if you asked me when I was 20, like, what do you want to be when you're 40? Like all those things like crashed and burned, at least for me. Um, yeah. And but then there came these opportunities along the way that I said, well, WTF, why not? And those turned out to be big things. Not all of them, but some of them did. They really shaped me. And, you know, I would not be, and I like who I am today, but I've had a very unorthodox career. I, some would say I have career ADD because I've done all these weird different things in my life. And for a long time, I felt very lost. I felt like I had missed the boat, that I don't have a career, and that I'm, I have nothing. And people like careers with paths. Like, oh, if you're an attorney, you're, you're a partner by this age, and you're making a million dollars by that age, and they like it, and, they, and you get respect for that at cocktail parties, rather than a real self, 
invented career because then people just don't believe you. Like I did these amazing things in, you know, Kathmandu and be like, that sounds like ridiculous. It's a war story. But at the end, it does matter because it, it changes the way you think. And then you come back from these really interesting experiences and you see the world in different and new ways. And then I have felt you have a duty to try to share that and teach that to others, carry it on somehow. How you do that's up to you. But I think, um, you know, get off the beaten path, see things in a different way, and don't always feel like you're totally lost at sea. Like I did, I felt I was lost at sea for many, many years. And then certainly later on in my life, it kind of snapped into place and all kind of uh, made sense in sort of a wax on, wax off way for people who know what that reference is. Oh, yeah, Mr. Miyagi. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, Sean, honestly, this is an awesome conversation, and you've given me a lot to think about. Your your book gave me a lot to think about, um, but it's definitely some of the things we talked about today. So I really appreciate you coming on and talking to us. This was definitely one of the more interesting conversations I've had in general, not just on a podcast episode. So thank you. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. And thanks, Zach. Good to talk to you, too. We're going to start the I Came With Fire mercenary group. So if you're looking for a mercenary group that's not very <laughs> equipped or experienced, yeah, sure. you just want to spend your money. We're armed with words uh, and mics. Yeah, Brandon, <laughs> and I got you. Yeah. Well, awesome. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Um, definitely go check out Sean's books. Um, I've read uh, New Rules of War. Do you want to pick up uh, your other ones? Definitely your novels. I want to check them out because uh, reading fiction, especially Tom Clancy when I was younger, was a, was a big passion of mine. So he's the yeah. next Tom Clancy. James Patterson says so. Um, please go check him out. <laughs> Sean, did you have anything else you'd like to impart before? Uh... Well, I would say uh, I've written three novels. Check out my last one called High Treason. You don't need to know the other two. It's not like Game of Thrones. If you don't know the other novels, you're lost. Uh, it's it's start there. It's a fun. It's a, it's the fun novel, the funnest. Um, I would say uh, to all your listeners, you know, be sneaky. Think sneaky, and uh, remember the Ratatouille rule that a great not everybody can be a great strategist, but a great strategist can come from anywhere. So um, just because you're whatever 19 and you're doing whatever doesn't mean that um, you don't have a strategic mind, and doesn't mean that we the world can't benefit from it. I like that. Awesome. Cool. All right. Well, thank you again, Sean. Uh, everyone, we'll we'll post your books online. Is there a, a spot that you uh, you prefer them ordered from, or like you have your own website? No. Well, I do have a website, but let's go to Amazon. It's there. Audible, uh, Kindle, wherever. It's all there. Um, okay. Yep. When your episode goes live, uh, we'll go ahead and put your books on our social media so people can go get them. Definitely encourage everyone to do that. Check them out. Again, thank you for very much for coming on, and I uh, hope everyone has a great day. Thank you.